This is an important section. I wish more would have been here because we're going to make some comparisons of what happened in 161 B.C. to what's happening now. We're going to talk about how academic accreditation opened the door for, literally opened the door for where we are now. Parents, you need to be aware <clears throat> of what's happening. These things that are happening are, this book is called, this is for parents who have young children or grandparents who have young grandchildren. It's called How to Protect Your Child from the New Age and Spiritual Deception. This is a wonderful book. It's brand spanking new. It's 2013. I began reading it, and it talks about what's happening in schools, at least in America. Uh, again, it's called How to Protect Your Child from the New Age and Spiritual Deception. It is, it is, it is so spot on. There are things that are happening in, ch in our lives you know, the typical, I used to be <clears throat> what would be considered today as ADD, attention deficit disorder. I would have been, one, I was one, and I was on a product or a drug called Vistaril uh, because I was hyper. I don't know, maybe I'm still hyper. <laughs> um, <laughs> Amen. Uh, back on the time when I was on that, on Vistaril, it was a time when I was in 10th grade, actually it was all the time, I just, they didn't, they didn't diagnose it until that time. <clears throat> but uh, what they are now calling attention deficit, attention deficit dis disorder is now called, is it the infinity child? It's called, I believe it's the infinity child, I can't remember now because I'm almost brain dead. And so now children who are considered hyper are actually considered children who uh, God is working specially in them, and so you, they're advising parents to put them in special programs. And these programs are, are programs so that these children will ultimately become channels. Say it again. And Deagle, thank you. Brain dead. <laughs> Got that eye right. <laughs> Indigo children. And so here is something that most parents who have a child who may not be challenged will want to know that their child is, is spiritually gifted. And so this book explains how every child is being funneled in that direction. It's called New Age, How to Protect Your Child from the New Age uh, and Spiritual Deception. It is a good book. I don't have anyone that's, that's young, but it is a good book. Uh, another book, The Occult Invasion into America. This book right here was written by Vance, Vance Farrell, and I know Vance, and he spent a ton of, t a, a lot of time. There were two parts, there are two parts to this book, part one and part two. One, part one is spiritual formation, part two is the occult invasion in America. And it talks about things like Saddleback Church, Willow Creek Church, um, Prophet, I mean Prophet, pro I must be tired. Um, what is it called? Come on brain, kick in. <laughs> Oh, uh, something driven church, purpose driven church. <laughs> I truly must be tired, but the Lord will give me the energy when I need it. Um, he talks about how the Eastern religion are coming in. Just to, just to give you an idea, he says, demonic healing applied to, p to patients in hospitals without their knowledge. Taught in public schools to increase ability to make mental pictures. Practiced in churches, retreats, Christian colleges and seminaries for meditation and deeper spirituality. Taking over psychology and psychiatry, taught as healthful, restful gym exercises, now in occult children toys, games, books, and cartoons on TVs and videos. It's called The Occult Invasion into America, opening Satan's doorway to the mind through mind emptying meditation. These two books will help you get a better understanding of what's going on and how it is, it is literally slipping in under our feet. And of course, education is one of the main tools that is, that is being used. So we are going to talk about how education has been co-opted by the en enemy. Let us have a word of prayer, if you will. Dear Father in heaven, kind and gracious and wonderful, merciful God, we come to you. Lord, we thank you 
that you've allowed us to come together as a, as a people on your Sabbath day and even into the new week. And now, Lord, as we go through this last session of the evening, we ask, Lord, that you will be with each and every one of us and that you will, that you will keep us awake for this last session, Lord. We ask that you will have your angels that exceed with power and with strength to touch our hearts and that as we are, our hearts are touched, that we will be riveted and understand the work that is ahead. We need to share this with as many as will hear, whether they will listen or forbear. Now bless us and keep us. Guide us and direct us and order our steps in your way is our prayer we ask in the matchless mighty name of our Savior, your darling Son, Jesus. We ask these blessings. Amen. The issue of accreditation, I call it a deadly affinity because there are so many things that are hidden in it. It's like the time when the 70 were sent down to, or the 70 went down to Egypt to supposedly teach the Egyptians down in Alexandria the Bible, and they came back pretty much turned around, and that's how we get the Septuagint. And so I want us to consider as something I've talked about several times before, the statement that we see in Revelation 12, 7. The Bible tells us, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. All this began as a result of war in heaven. And we said that Satan used a weapon as he went into war. Now the prophet tells us this, about Satan going into war. She says this in Great Controversy, page 589, Satan delights in war. Great Controversy 589, I want you to write this down and I want you to read this because there's a whole lot in here, a whole lot in here that we never have seen, never have noticed, at least I didn't, maybe I'm the slow one. Satan delights in war for it excites the worst passions of the soul and then sweeps into eternity its victims steeped in vice and blood. It is his ob object to incite the nations to war against one another for he can thus divert the minds of the people from the work of preparation to stand in the day of God. We are told again by the prophet that through those who depart from the faith, the power of the enemy will be exercised to lead others astray. We said earlier that hypnotism was banned by the General Conference, page 613 in Bible Commentary, volume 10. No hypnotism in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And if spiritual formation is a form of hypnotism, it should not be in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Again, the prophet says, Satan delights in war for it exerts excites the worst passions, for he can thus divert the minds of the people from the work of preparation. Could it be, brothers and sisters, could it possibly be that 9-11 was a deception, not a deception from an inside job, but a deception nonetheless? Could 9-11 have been the deception that allowed us to be where we are right now? Brothers and sisters, we are told that great changes are soon to take place in our world and the final movements will be rapid ones. Volume 9, T11. Great changes began at that time and nothing has been the same ever since. Satan's true masterpiece of deception, his true masterpiece of deception. Why would this be a masterpiece of deception? We said he delights in war. Could this be the deception that has slipped past the people of God while we were looking at George Bush and Pentagon and the towers going down and, and New York City and all these things were going on, Satan was working his masterpiece of deception, which we have more often than not thought it was one thing while it was something absolutely different. Because when 9-11 happened, brothers and sisters, we are told spiritual formation as a tool for church growth was approved for all 13 regions of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in September of 2001. While everybody was looking at the towers going down, somebody was signing a document saying, Let allow, let's allow spiritual formation to come into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I do not accuse it of happening on that day. Whether it happened on the 1st of September or the 30th of September, most minds were focused on the towers coming down. And as the towers were coming down, even if it was done on the 1st, 
by the time September 11th happened, nobody was focusing on what are they doing behind the recesses. Everybody wanted in the United States revenge for what had happened on 9-11. It truly is a spiritual, it truly is a masterpiece of deception. You can find this in the Adventist News Network magazine, April 3rd, 2004. Spiritual formation as a tool for church growth was brought in to the Seventh-day Adventist church and it is now in every single Protestant church. What was the groundwork that allowed this to happen? Let us consider back in 1935, the Branson Report. Branson's report is delivered at the Autumn Council, October 30th, 1935, presentation of the report of the survey, the Commission on Education on Accreditation. On Accreditation. It was in 1931 at the Autumn Council in Omaha that the question of accreditation of our schools was given consideration, at which time it was decided we should enter upon an accreditation program for our educational institutions. Let us pause and put a pen right here because in order for us to become a part of the accredited system, we have to go to the system that accredits all colleges. And the accreditation system is a, is a system that was initiated by the university system. We wanted to have universities, and here is the person that initiated the university system. His name is Pope Boniface VII. The beginning of the university system happened in 1303. Boniface II, the seventh, was a patron of learning, founding a university, the first university at Rome in 1303. In other words, when the university system came on the scene, it was a part of the universal church. In order to be accredited, in order to be a part of the accreditation process, you have to go ultimately through the university system. And if you go through the university system, you have gone to Rome and asked Rome for protection. Just like we saw in 161 BC, the very same thing happened when we went through the accreditation process. The beginning of the university system began with Boniface VII. Authorization in the article on, Br on the Branson Report. Authorization was given at that time in 1931, 35 was the approval. Authorization was given at that time for junior and senior colleges to seek accreditation Although certain restrictions and safeguards were thrown around the action, all the brethren who were present at the Omaha Council when this action was taken entered into the proposition with fear and trembling and many misgivings. Even those who were most favorable to the plan recognized that it was, un it was confronted with great danger and that probably we would find that there would be some losses along the way. There should be a caution sign right there because there are only two kind of losses that can be found when a system like this is implemented. Either you're going to lose the school or you're going to lose the students. The school or the students. And when you're playing, when you're making experiments, you should not be experimenting with other people's children. It was decided at that time by one of our leading workers as being a war measure. It was stated in the action itself that it was an emergency measure. The reason for the emergency seemed to be the fact that we were facing a situation as we understood it that would make it all but impossible to go on with certain lines of training unless our schools were accredited. Another pause, brothers and sisters. When we, were, when we received the blueprint in the 1800s, we had everything that we needed. Amen. There was nothing more that we needed in order for us to finish the work. And so in order to be a part of the accredited system, we must, want to, we must have been going outside of the blueprint. This is true of the AMA approved medical work. They stated that it would be impossible for the College of Medical Evangelists to receive students from junior and senior colleges unless these colleges were accredited with regional accreditation associations. I am confused because when we look at the students who would be going to medical missionary college, if they were coming from Seventh-day Adventist schools into another Seventh-day Adventist school, who could interrupt or intercede between the Seventh-day Adventist colleges and medical missionary college? Is there an emergency or was the emergency perceived? It was not our educational men. It was not the teachers, at least not at, as a group. 
it, who brought this pressure upon us at the council, but it seemed to be the general conviction of the leadership of the movement. We went into it together. No one group of workers can be singled out as whom we can point the finger and state that, 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 that they led us into it. It was said that we went into it unitedly, believing that it was the best thing to do under the circumstances. We decided to go down that road even though there were misgivings and even though the educational men were not exactly the ones who were in favor of it. And when we did the same thing that Israel did, we have to accept that what happens after you become accredited is the same thing that's going to happen in all the schools who are accredited that are not Seventh-day Adventist schools, as well as if those schools do not teach from the spirit of prophecy, you will ultimately not be teaching from the spirit of prophecy as well in order to maintain your accreditation. There were certain safeguards after the action authorization of the school to receive accreditation. We passed these recommendations with which we endeavored to minimize the danger we knew. We knew, we knew the danger would attend an effort of this sort. Children, young people, young adults ha would have to be sacrificed in order to push forward this agenda. Whereas we know full well from the spirit of prophecy, here's the red light, no longer a yellow light, we know full well from the spirit of prophecy that by sending our teachers to the universities of the world for advanced degrees, we are exposing them to great danger. It is evidenced by the number of our men who have already in this way lost their hold upon God. We realize that there's a great danger to our system of Christian education through the molding influence of these worldly schools on our teachers. So we don't send our teachers to the world anymore. We bring the world into our schools and teach them the same things that our students, our, our teachers would have received in worldly institutions. We did not change anything. All we did was started working for our enemy. It was determined that we recommend that in the selection of teachers, this is what really shakes, or really, is, it's just a challenging part to understand. We recommend that in the selection of teachers to attend the universities, only persons of outstanding Christian experience and who have been successful in the Christian work should be chosen persons whose faith in the Bible and spirit of prophecy is well grounded and who realize that in attending the university, they are being exposed to subtle and almost unconscious influences of infidelity. Persons who believe with all their hearts in the superiority of Christian education. This is public knowledge. This is called the Branson Report on Accreditation of Seventh-day Adventist Colleges. This was what opened the door for accreditation. And as a result of it opened the door for accreditation, we have to accept spiritual formation. Nothing is allowed to stand in this movement, in the way of this movement. In fact, the president at that time, President Anderson, made the following statement. He said, I am afraid we will rule the day, this day, if we go ahead with this program. And so accreditation to us, brothers and sisters, accreditation ultimately meant that all the schools, all the Seventh-day Adventist schools would have to accept spiritual formation. It is a tool that the enemy is using but the Lord is allowing to come in so that those who do not have the hold on him as they should through the study of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy will be purged out of the, out of the school, I mean out of the church. The prophet says spiritualism is about to take the world captive and this is why it's about to take the world captive because it's in everything. There are many who think that spiritualism is upheld through trickery and imposture. But this is far from the truth. Superhuman power is working in a variety of ways and few have any idea as to what will be the manifestations of spiritualism in the future. She said this back in the early 1900s, 1905. The foundation of the success of spiritualism has been laid in the assertions that have been made from the pulpits of our land. The ministers have proclaimed as, have proclaimed as Bible doctrines falsehoods that have originated with the arch deceiver. Things that are taught in accredited schools are the falsehoods that originated with the arch deceiver. 
It has been the custom to exalt books and authors that do not present the proper foundation for true education. For from, who, from what source did these authors obtain their wisdom? If we're teaching from someone who's not a Seventh-day Adventist, we have to find where their wisdom came from. And their wisdom, brothers and sisters, did not come from on high. A large share of which, of which does not deserve our respect, she says, even if the authors are regarded as being wise men. Have they taken their lessons from the greatest teacher, Jesus, that the world ever knew? If not, they are decidedly in the fault. Those who are preparing for the heavenly abodes should be recommended to make the Bible their chief book of study. And so we look at Satan's plan for, his, for our church, and his plan is such. The prophet says Satan's chief work is at the headquarters of our faith. He spares no, plan, no pains to corrupt men in responsible positions and to persuade them to be unfaithful to their trust. This is not attacking the church. This is attacking men. This is saying men who have a trust, they are, have been trusted with, our, with God's church. And if God is trusting them with their church, then God is going to hold them accountable and the prophet has been given information so that they can also read what their responsibilities are. It is Satan's plan to weaken the faith of God's people in the testimonies. Next follows skepticism in regard to the vital points of our faith, the pillars of our position, then doubt as to the Holy Scriptures, and then the downward march to perdition. When the testimonies which were once believed are doubted and given up, Satan knows the decided ones will not stop at this, and he redoubles his efforts till he launches them into open rebellion, which becomes incurable and ends in destruction. As a result of accreditation, there are people now in positions, brothers and sisters, who have been inspired and influenced by writings, by non-inspired writings, writers. And as a result of them being inspired, we see that people like myself, other people who are in self-supportive ministries, cannot speak in anywhere except places like this because I don't have a degree in theology. I have a degree. I have several. I have a couple. I have a master's degree. But I don't have a degree in theology. And I'm not an approved speaker. And if you're not an approved speaker, you cannot speak at a church. If you're not an approved speaker and you get invited to go to something like this, these are the things that are, these are the type of letters that go out to those who would come in here. This is an actual document. See the letterhead. You can't see, it's, it's so fuzzy, I can barely see it up here myself. But let me read it to you. This section, this right here is about someone I know who, who was to speak at a church in Plumstead, England. He's a present truth, conservative speaker. Here is the letter to all church officers and leaders in whatever capacity you serve the church. As you are aware, the church board and, uh, and South England Conference has not approved the program which has been authorized by a few board members. Curiosity may have gotten the better of, of you resulting in your attendance to date. We, the church board, would like to encourage you not to attend any more of these meetings and to have nothing to do further to do with the program in any capacity as your very presence and involvement sends the wrong message to the church family and shows that you are going against church board authority and ruling. The constituted authority of the church, the local church, which, which subject you to church discipline. If you wish to continue attending the meetings, the right and honorable thing to do is to resign from your office position. However, if you choose not to resign, then as pastor and chairman of the board, you are instructed to cease functioning in your office department position with immediate effect. A business meeting is scheduled for the 15th of May, 2010, at 4 o'clock p.m., where the church board will recommend to the church members that you be removed from your church office. It is requested that you make contact with our church clerk as a matter of utmost urgency to inform the church board of your decision by Thursday, May the 13th. The church board will have their meeting on the 15th. If Thursday is the 13th, when is the church board meeting? At what time? 
So it's more important to, to remove people from office than to keep the Sabbath holy, it, correct? See how that rebellion starts working? See how it happens? That certain amount of power that you think you have, it makes you go against the Lord. It makes, them, makes you go against the Lord's servants. And we see in no uncertain terms, what time is sunset on the 15th? 8.46 p.m.? What time is the meeting? Four o'clock? Was the Sabbath violated? The Sabbath was violated. That's what happens when Satan moves in. He starts making those things that he wants to happen more important than God's work. I'll skip that. We are told a new organization as a result of this, a new organization would be established. This is a result of accreditation. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders of this system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of this new movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be built on sand and storm and tempest, which would sweep away the structure. And so these things come in. They come in and they start making us embold, making some emboldened in what they're doing. We see things like spiritual discipleship or spiritual disciplines, including spiritual disciplines which include something like confession. And don't take my word for it. You can see here or on the other one that this is something that is coming from the organized group. In fact, when we think and we look at the issue of confession, we are told that it turns out Dr. Pennebacher this is from the article. This is, a, this is actually an article that you can get on, online. It's called I Follow or the I Follow Program. Confession is good for the soul is, it, is, is this subtopic. It turns out that Dr. Pennebacher has run studies for years that show the healing powers of what he calls confessional. Sharing, journaling, talking out loud, even to oneself, and prayer. He found that it improves blood pressure, insomnia, psychological well-being, and immune function. Confession enhances both psychological and physical health. In other words, science once again agrees with what Seventh-day Adventists have believed for years. We are whole, not dualistic beings. One, our personalities and living bodies are our souls, and what affects one affects the other. This is part of spiritual formation, confession of one's sins. And you substantiate it by saying it improves a person's health status. Satan, we are told, the prophet tells us that Satan will make some ill and then make them well. And so we see that see, through confession, beloved, when the demons come in, it allows for you to be subject to the demons and then the demons can make you sick. And then when the demons make you sick and you get well because of some new kind of spiritual formation, now you're giving credit. You think you're, you think you're under a miracle. These are the things that we have been warned would happen in these last days. In fact, brothers and sisters, one would say, how could this happen? How could spiritual formation come in so easily well, it appears that in Adventist News Network, the article I referenced a few minutes ago, Adventist News Network, the title of the article, is, uh, which is po posted April 3rd, 2004, says, the featured article, Church Congregations Increase Focus on Spiritual Formation. www.adventist.org, you can get the article unless they've pulled it. For the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a wake-up call was sounded after a 2002 survey showed that, through doc that though doctrinal understanding was high, there are several areas of concern, including low involvement in daily prayer, Bible study, active Christian witness to the community, and participation in community service. I have traveled all over Australia and a good part of the United States, and I have only found one person who thinks that they took this study or survey I don't know anyone take this study. Again, I get the same response. These concerns about spiritual formation, these concerns can be linked to how the church rates in the area of spiritual 
formation. Remember this, the article we read in the session before where they said using key words in publications, in literature, in, 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 this, in meetings, using key, key words to direct the idea or the thoughts of the church, that would be how they would bring this, this new paradigm shift. So here we see in this article, these concerns can be linked to how the church rates in the area of spiritual formation, which has been defined by one Adventist church pastor as the process of becoming a mature disciple of God. Another person describes it as whatever you do to specifically nourish your relationship with God. I am impressed that the pioneers were not mature Christians. Very impressed that they, were not, that they were not mature Christian. Today, we are told in the article, today the subject is receiving serious emphasis in Adventist institutions, as well as in local congregations. Though the, con though the church doesn't have an accredited educational program in 2004, accredited program, dealing with spiritual formation at any of its theological schools, it's seeing the subject become more common in today's modern seeking world. We are seeing the word being used more and more. Back then in 2004, the author continues and says spiritual formation. Notice how this article is rife with the word spiritual formation. Spiritual formation is not a new idea or concept, and a lot of Protestants are in the same boat. We are rediscovering, it says, John Dibdahl. Has anyone ever heard that name? He was just here about a, he was here about a month ago, right? He was just in Sydney, I believe, running a program. And I don't want you to buy it. But John Dibdahl says, traditionally, the Adventist church has emphasized intellectual truth and accepting certain facts and ideas about God. Dibdahl says, Pastor Martin Felbush, associate director of Adventist Chaplaincy Ministries, whose work brings him in contact with leaders of several other denominations, says that the Adventist church is not alone in its quest. A lot of churches out there are struggling with the same issues as we are. John Jensen, pastor of the 150-member South Bay Adventist Church in Torrance, California, says there's a need for spiritual formation. More and more thought leaders are using the term, but what knocked me off my seat was when I saw this. Oh, it knocked me off my seat. Sometimes I worry about, are you going to throw your shoes at me when I, say, when I show you this one? Jensen says that without spiritual formation, a person would be what? Spiritually uncivilized. He means that you are not ready to call yourself a Christian. What would, you be, what would a person who's uncivilized be? They're not, they're, they shouldn't be a part of society. And so what he's saying is we shouldn't, those who do not go through spiritual formation are not to be considered a part of Christian society. A person who's uncivilized, they, they act like they're uncivilized. What does that say? They don't act like the rest of the people. This is what is in the article. It is the process by which they can go from being a spiritual infant, all you babies in here, to spiritual maturity, developing the potential that God put within you. Doesn't that sound like Tony Robbins developing the potential in you? That's why we started this discussion with, with multi-level marketing. So you could see that it's all the same process that Satan has been using. The Adventist World Church created the International Board of Ministerial and Theological Education, the IBMTE, in September 2001. Remember, we saw those towers going down. Designed to provide overall guidance and standards to the professional training of pastors, evangel evangelists, theologians, teachers, chaplains, and other denominational employees involved in ministerial and religious formation or spiritual formation in each of the church's 13 regions around the world. That means everyone who is involved in getting any form of what our doctrines are to students, top to bottom, whether it's a primary school teacher, a middle school, academy, or college, every single person has to go through spiritual formation. Paul said, for I know when I leave that there will come grievous wolves and not sparing the flock, and from within there will be those who will be developing disciples. Here it is, through the accreditation process. Now, by the order 
Watch this and tell me if Ellen White is not a prophet. Now, by the order of the General Conference, IBMTE, Jesuit spiritual formation and spiritual directors comprise all of the structural ministry, ministerial cadre. Students in the colleges are now taking spiritual formation classes. Spiritual formation groups have been formed in the churches and a completely new class of ministers called spiritual directors has been established. Let's see how the prophet said that. She said a new organization would be established. Let's see it again. A completely new class of ministers called spiritual directors has been established. She said a new organization would be established. Is she a prophet or is she not? The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded. We saw that in the article where the pastor said, we will meet to remove you on the Sabbath. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of this new movement. Nothing would be allowed. And these who will be called spiritual directors will also have to be certified by an organization called Spiritual Directors International, a global network of confession. Spiritual Directors International is spanning the globe. You can go on their website with an organized network of confession, hearing, spiritual directors. Spiritual Directors International began in 1989 in a gathering of spiritual directors of the Christian faith at Mercy Center in Burlingame, California, USA. Spiritual Directors International website purpose and history of spiritual directors international the prophet said the enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among seventh-day adventists and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in the process of reorganization state of the dead is one of the doctrines of our faith and to be involved in spiritual formation means you have given up one of the doctrines of your faith. We have been told that we, that the church would give up. This is not what I say. I am not a prophet. The prophet said it would consist of giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that, church, that God is, in his wisdom has given the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be counted as error. Those of you who are uncivilized, tell me, did that not happen? We are told that spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius Loyola are a plan of contemplation to be carried out over about a month. Ignatius Loyola was the founder of the Jesuits and was canonized by Pope Gregory the, 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 the 15th in 1622 he published the spiritual exercises in 1548 and they are now a part of all the accredited schools in the entire accreditation system every single school has to have it every school and now that there is a jesuit pope brothers and sisters you can be a hundred percent sure that it's going to go even further throughout not just not just the colleges, but it's going to happen in the middle school. As a matter of fact, in the article in Yahoo on May, can't even think, April 17, 2013, it says with Pope Francis, it's prime time for Jesuits. Yahoo, and this is Associated Press as well, it's a prime time for, for Pope Francis. It's prime time for the Jesuits. Just a quick couple of notes. It says right here where it says, let... No, we have to go a little further up. For decades, the Society of Jesus has faced the same struggles to find priests that have plagued the wider Roman Catholic Church. The Reverend Chuck Federico, one of the priests who evaluate Jesuit applicants, says he usually heard from five a week or fewer. Then last month in March, the former Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio stepped out on the balcony of St. Peter's Basilica, the first Jesuit to be elected Pope. The number of queries jumped to four or five a day from five four or five a week to four or five a day that is a 400 to 500 percent increase a 400 to 500 percent increase up oh, move too fast lay people now staff most jesuit schools and ministers so the order has started jesuit spirituality retreats and instructions for lay faculty 
and staff to help maintain the religious identity of what they have built among the newer Jesuit initiatives are high school or middle schools and poor communities. Top down and bottom up. We're seeing it happen everywhere. We're seeing it happen everywhere. Beloved, we are in a time when what Tuppersaw say is, says will make the entire world look like zombies. He says again, one's conscience has been altered. One's soul and brain have been washed. One's liberty has been sacrificed to authority. One's individuality has been surrendered to the Christ of Rome. One no longer has the will of one's own. One volunteers for any assigned task, no matter how adverse. No matter how adverse, we will ultimately see a world where people are like this. Where anything that establishes individual, individuality will be removed. The objective of spiritual formation, brothers and sisters, is oh, to make sure that every single Protestant on this planet says, I am an evangelical. As a matter of fact, the past president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church said, I am a Seventh-day Adventist evangelical. That is documented. I am an evangelical. The only people who will not be evangelicals on this planet will be the 144,000. That's just the truth. The other thing, the only the other purpose of spiritual, forma spiritual exercise and spiritual formation is to make it so that church tradition, the church manual, are more important or more vital than the Bible. In other words, they are held in higher esteem than the Bible. And finally, brothers and sisters, the purpose of spiritual exercises or spiritual formation is the total destruction of Protestantism. Absolute total destruction of Protestantism. As I said before, quoting from Paul, he said, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. The purpose of spiritual formation is to destroy the three angels' message. Make of none effect the testimony of God. How many times have we seen things come in? How many times does the prophet have to tell us about this? She's told us over and over again. She said, I saw a train of cars. I saw the rapidity with which this delusion was spreading. She says, it was moving with lightning speed. A train of cars was shown me going with the speed of lightning. The angel bade me look carefully. It seemed that the whole world was on board that there could not be one left. Satan wants to make sure that there is not one single person left. A train of cars with the entire world on it. However, brothers and sisters, said the angel, they are binding in bundles ready to burn. Binding in bundles ready to burn. He showed me the conductor who appeared like a stately fair person whom all the passengers looked up to and reverence. Everybody is looking at this as the best thing since sliced bread. It is a tool for church growth. Churches are growing all over the world. We need this too. I was perplexed, she said, and asked my attending angel who, who it was. He said, it is Saint, Satan as an angel of light. He has taken the world captive. They are given over to strong delusions to believe a lie that they all might be damned. And then she said, then she saw the next one in charge, this agent, the next highest in order to him. Remember, two writers said that it was Satan who raised up, or it was hell who raised up the judge, which she says this agent, the next highest in order to him is the engineer and other of his agents are employed in different offices as he may need them and they are all going with lightning speed to perdition. She says, let us give no strange place, no, no place to the strange exercising. No place to these strange exercising which really take the mind away from the deep movings of the Holy Spirit. God's work is characterized, is ever characterized by calmness and dignity, not these vain repetitions that we are seeing. 
She said, I saw that the Lord had given the world opportunity to discover the snare, and when the world had the opportunity to cover the snare, no one looked. When they saw that a Jesuit was the new pope, a Jesuit, not just a Jesuit, but he was defined as a Jesuit of the highest order. What is a Jesuit of the highest order? He is described in the New York Times as a conservative with a compassionate touch. If you are a conservative Jesuit, that means you believe in the Jesuit oath at its very fiber. At its very fiber. Pope Francis said, when we walk without the cross, when we build without the cross, and we pro when we proclaim Christ without the cross, we are not disciples of the Lord. See the buzzword, the root of spiritual discipleship? We are worldly, he says. He told the mass, mass ranked of cardinals clad in gold vestments. See, brothers and sisters, those buzzwords are being used. Disciples. We may be bishops, priests, cardinals, popes, all of this, but we are not disciples of the Lord, he added. And it's a wonder that everyone is talking about discipleship, and all of a sudden a new pope comes and starts talking about we are not disciples. Reuters. March the 14th, the day after his being named the Pope. Martin, Malachi Martin says this about the Jesuits. This is an important statement found in the book, The Jesuits. He says, in long-range influence, since 1521, in long-range influence, Ignino Loyola surpasses even the greatest of his contemporaries, Charles V, who was an emperor of Spain, emperor of the entire Europe. Henry VIII of England, Ivan the, Ter the Terrible of Russia, Luther, Martin Luther, Calvin, Salomena, the Magnificent. And this is why, because what Loyola constructed is still in place. He's only known for one thing, brothers and sisters, and that's spiritual exercises. It's still in place, still functioning, and still considered so important that entire regimes, revolutionary, and otherwise tie their fortunes to its influence. Countries, when they want to see another country overturned, they call in the Jesuits. Why? Because Ignatius understood more than any other leader of men who preceded him that the best way to raise a man to a, to a certain ideal is to become a master of his imagination, master his mind through hypnotism. We imbue into him spiritual forces which he would find very difficult to eliminate later. Forces more lasting than all the best principles and doctrines, these forces can come up again to the surface sometime after years of not even mentioning them and become so imperative that the will finds itself unable to oppose any obstacle and has to follow their irresistible impulses. This is from the book, The Jesuits, by Henry Bamer, Heinrich Bamer, page 24, 34, and 35. The will finds itself unable to oppose any obstacle and has to follow their irresistible impulses is it a wonder that in Testimonies to the Churches, Volume 1, page 578, Sister White said they became a Catholic procession. They could not resist. Their will was not powerful enough. Your will will not be powerful enough. That is why we are told to stay clear from this science that Satan introduced in heaven to the angels. The influence of, of Satan's work through the magicians, we have defined and determined that the magicians in the courts of Pharaoh are the Jesuits today. Their influence, the influence of Satan's work through the magicians would reach down through all ages and would destroy in the minds of many the true faith and the mighty miracles and works of Christ, which would be performed by him when he should come to this world. We are in the last seconds of Earth's history. We are in enchanted ground. We are told we are on enchanted ground. And Satan is continually at work to rock our people to sleep. Oh, brothers and sisters, we are being rocked to sleep in the cradle of carnal security. There is an indifference, a lack of zeal that paralyzes all our efforts. Jesus was a zealous worker. Are we going to be zealous? And when his followers shall lean on him and work as he worked, they will see and realize corresponding results. We should press steadily forward unmoved by censure, unmoved by censure, 
I'm sure many of us will be censured when we preach a message like this. Uncorrupted by applause, it will be a greater task to work back upon a proper basis than many suppose, but it must be done in order to save our institutions from embarrassment. Last two or three slides. We see these things happening every day. World leaders beating a path to Rome's door. World leaders beating a path to Rome's door. Then the whole world wandered after the beast. The whole world wanders after the beast and don't even know that they're wandering after the beast. Have no idea that the beast is the beast. They can look dead in the beast's face and not know that that's the beast. Not even know that that is the beast. What is that, brothers and sisters? What is that? It looks like a snake, serpent, snake. Could look like a dinosaur, Tyrannosaurus rex. It does look like some type of amphibian or reptile or something to that effect. But when we kind of clear it up a little bit, and let's clear this up just a little bit. What does that look like? The whole world wonders after the beast. It looks like Christ, doesn't it? It looks like Christ, doesn't it? But when we step back just a little further and look and see what it really looks like, then we see this is called the resurrection, the resurrection sculpture that's found in the Vatican where the Pope every Wednesday gives a homily to 6,100 people and this statue is called the resurrection. This is, a, this is supposed to be a representat representation of Christ pulling up the souls out of the, bo the, the bombing of the atom bomb. But interesting enough, we see this. This is supposed to be Christ, but Christ never had a tail. And thousands of people, thousands of people go and see this every Wednesday, and they're wandering after the beast, and they don't even realize it. The whole world is wandering after the beast, whether it be in a sculpture or whether it be in spiritual formation, spiritual exercises, the drums, Whatever it may be, brothers and sisters, the whole world is wandering after the beast, and we don't even know it. We're willing to sit up under something and not know what it is, not willing to say this far and no further. People pay dear money to go and sit down and say, oh, I saw the Pope. Strangely enough, brothers and sisters, Jesus still asked the same question in Psalms 94:16. He says, who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Who is willing to stand and say this far and no further in your own churches? It's coming. It's here. It is right here. You only have, you, we, me, us, we, whatever you want to call it, we only have a couple more months before the national, before the church and state issue. Let me make sure we are 100% clear on that. Let me make sure we are absolutely clear because people have come and asked me, what does it mean for the United States to be adjudicating church and state? The United States Supreme Court is the last, the last court in the judicial system in America. When the United States Supreme Court makes a decision, it is bound. And if the United States Supreme Court says church and state can be one, that means the next thing can happen is the evangelicals or whatever church group in the United States can now go to their congressmen and senators and say, our church wants this to be done that way. And with all the things that are happening in the United States, as well as in, in the world, with, with 14 states in the United States now approving civil unions, it's pushing the, it's pushing the pendulum in one direction to the liberality. But ultimately, those evangelicals who are conservative, if they get church and state united, they're going to pull it back all the way to the right. And they're going to say to their legislators, we made sure you got votes. We helped you get votes. Now you help us get a national Sunday law. Make everybody go to church on Sunday. The first step is to have it as a legislative law. And all they need is for this session in the United States Supreme Court to approve church and state coming together. 
That's all is needed. And as I said earlier this morning, there are six Catholics and three Jews and no Protestants in a Protestant country on the Supreme Court. Not to mention that one of the Jews on there, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, feels that the United States con Constitution is not the template. The South African Constitution is a template. We are rounding to the end. No longer can we wait for someone, we no longer can we wait for it to be in the church bulletin. I don't know if you've ever read the book Christ, uh, Pilgrim's Progress where the two men were waiting for the, waiting for the church bulletin to publicize it. You're only going to get it if someone gives it independently to you or you get it through an email. Do not expect it to come in the mail. If you want to confirm what I'm saying, go online and look for it, look for, it for yourself. These are solemn times. And in a solemn time, Satan is going to build up barriers between you and the truth. So it's going to depend on each and every one of you to prove and see if what I'm telling you is the truth. I know it is. And those who I've been with can know it is as well. You have to prove it for yourself. Be like the Bereans. Go and see what I'm saying. See if what I'm saying is the truth. Go just Google church and state in the United States. Church and state um, Supreme Court. Type, uh, Google uh, United States Supreme Court nukes church and state. Google that. See if that is true. And see when it happens. It's going to tell you October of 2013. Serious, very serious times. And so, brothers and sisters, what we're going to do? What you're going to do? What you're going to do now? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. We're going to keep on, my wife, my, my wife and I are going to continue. We're going to keep on serving the Lord. If it seem, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you today who you will serve because you're not going to have many more opportunities to hear, hear. I don't know what's going to happen. When you preach sermons like this, you don't just get in trouble with the church. You don't just get in trouble with the church. I can only depend upon the Lord to protect me. I can only depend upon him. But this is important enough to me that I'm sharing it with you. That's what's important. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to keep on serving and sending this message. Pray for me. Pray for my wife. She's back in, back in Tennessee by herself. And I pray that she's okay. But she has given me permission to come. Don't expect me to come too many more times without her. So brothers and sisters, we have one more meeting tomorrow night. In that meeting, we will talk about an important topic that has been overlooked. We're going to talk about repentance. Again, you might want to consider those two books. I think those books, I would recommend them. I would, if, especially if you have children, how to protect your child from the new age and spiritual deception. And if you want to understand what's going on, how we got here, the occult invasion in America. Brothers and sisters, if you don't need a pair of shoes, don't buy shoes. If you don't need a pair of pants, don't buy pants. Put every penny you have into this work. Become an employee for God or support someone who is providing information because you don't want all that that you have to come down upon your shoulders. Not, not like a big rock because God is going to say you didn't use it for me. There's no point in give, letting you have it. It's going to be the money. You're going to throw the money out in the streets anyway. I could keep going on, but it is getting late. I'd love to go on, but I'm going to close us out. You've been a wonderful, wonderful audience. Everybody knows that I love Australia. It's just too hot to live here. <laughs> Again, I don't know how you do it, but, uh, but, but I see something here that I wish we had in the United States, and that is a desire to make sure what happened many years ago with the apostasy to make sure it doesn't continue here. And praise God for that here. I wish, we could, I, wish I could take it back with me to the United States. So I want to ask you, who, if you're not going to make it here tomorrow night, pray for myself and my wife. If you desire to email me and ask any more questions, there's our information, our phone number, whatever. Brothers and sisters, I cannot tell you how important this is. I really can't. I know people who are preaching messages like this, and our beloved brothers and sisters are going home without even saying, what does this mean? 
we need to know exactly what's going on with this church and state issue and what, what it really means. I have a copy of the actual court date, the, the actual entire um, trial, everything about it. I have that as well. And the articles, you can get those as well. You need to know this. Please pass these out like the leaves of autumn. Somewhat, the article itself is only one page long. It's two articles, one page long. You should pass them out to everybody who you know, those who you've been telling a Sunday law is coming, as well as those in the church. It's important. It is eternally important that you know where we are and that you know that the prophet told us we would be here. Nothing to be scared of. It's now time to say, Lord, thank you for allowing me to see this. These are interesting times. They are wonderful times, and we all need to be ready. So I ask you to take one last out. One, have, I ask you to pray one more time with me. But I ask you, even after today, continue to pray for the Burns family and our ministry because we need your prayers. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we again are humbled by your mercy and your grace and how you are so patient with your people. And Lord, we know we have fallen short all so many times and we ask you to forgive us for our laziness and slothfulness. But Lord, we ask at this particular time that you will strengthen us for this awesome task that is ahead of us. Lord, we know that as the pioneers had the experience that was sweet in their mouth but bitter in their belly, we now see, Lord, that what is coming will be so bitter in our mouths, but we know that in our belly we will all be able to say heaven is cheap enough. And so, Lord, as we wait, as we wait for you to come, prepare us for the work that we have to do, that we will be those who you can say here is the patience of the saints. We want to be those saints. We want to endure till the end. Give us the strength that we do not now have. We ask that you will purge us of whatever it is that is keeping us from you. Teach us how to pray as we need to pray. Teach us how to pray as Jesus prayed. But Lord, we do not want to take shortcuts in praying to other human beings and asking other human beings. We know that your word and your prophet have told us how to pray. And so, Lord, we depend upon you to guide us through these last few inches of earth's history. Bless each and every person that is here, each and every family that is represented, and I offer a special prayer for the children, not just the children that are here, but all the children who are represented and the parents that are here, Lord. We pray that our children will find their way back into the ark. For, Lord, we know that it is our prayers that you will answer. So bless us and keep us. Continue to be with this wonderful ministry, Steps to Life. And bless all those who have self-supportive ministry, who are taking your message to a dying world, those who are keeping the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel high over their heads. Lord, teach us and show us the importance of the three angels' message so we can take it to a dying planet. Bless us and keep us is our prayer we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>